Hello, everyone, and welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Connected. This time around, we are talking to one of the stars of, I would probably say, one of my favorite binge watches in recent years. It's sex education star Asa Butterfield. Hey, Asa, how you doing? Hey, Perry. I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So, someone tipped me off that you're, you've got some cats. I do. <gasps> Oh, I need to, they're both outside. Oh, you can't, you can't do that. I'm, I'm going to end up running off to try and grab mine. I do. I've got two of them. Um, they've been giving me very, keeping me good company for the last, uh, last few months. I, I imagine they're living the dream right now, having you home all oh, the time. Yeah, they have. Like we installed, we, they used to have this cat scratcher and we made it go all the way up the walls. Now they're, they're like, yeah. And we got them. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to go into too much detail because uh, if people think I'm a crazy cat person, don't but do that with me too. Because I been, will uh, go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, they've been loving life um, and enjoying all the attention uh, of having <laughs> us at home pretty much every day. Uh, yeah. Dewey, Dewey's in the same same position. He enjoys uh, thinking that he's helping me with all of my interviews. Yeah, by sitting on your on your computer, right on your yeah, keyboard. So- at some point, my leg will go numb. I will have to move, and then I will distract everything. Uh, on to you, though, right now. Uh, on Collider Connected, we always start at the beginning, and obviously, you've been in this industry for an extremely long time since you were very young. So way back then, did the initial interest in acting come from you naturally, or was it a situation where, I don't know, a parent or something encouraged you to try an after-school activity and it clicked? When I was a kid, um, and even after my first kind of couple jobs, uh, I, I never grew up like thinking, oh, I want to be an actor. That's like, that was never like my goal. Uh, and I think that actually ended up sort of working in my favor um, because when I started, so I started going to this after-school drama club um and I went my brother went there and my mom sort of wanted us to kind of come out of our shell and kind of be more a bit more social and, uh, and it's I think it's great for kids to, to do those sorts of things um and so I went to this uh drama class it was called Young Actors Theatre uh, and I started going there when I was six or seven um and yeah as I said just kind of went there for fun never kind of anticipated making a career out of it and uh I started getting some auditions some they would have cast directors come in and, and watch some of the classes. A couple of them wanted me to audition for things. Now. So I was like, oh, yeah, why not? I went along with it. Um, didn't really know what acting was. And kind of, I think when you're that age, and at least in my first, especially my first role, you you really just kind of go along with it and you don't think too much about it. And kind of, you're not trying to kind of break down scenes and get into the mind of this character. You're just a kid and you just kind of like make believe. So I... I just kind of enjoyed being in those situations and kind of doing what kids do a lot of the time, just imagine, imagining things, going along with it and having fun. Um, and so that's where it started. And that's where I kind of started. That's where the love of it started. Um, and I guess it wasn't until a bit later on, uh, around about when I did Hugo, uh, that I started kind of looking a bit more into the future. And, and not only that, but also the kind of, this kind of wider scope of acting and, and, and filmmaking as a whole and, and my appreciation for cinema and all of the bits that go into it, not just as an actor, but the sound and the music, and, uh, uh, the cinematography and the set designs, um, which on Hugo were, as you can imagine, a 13 year old stepping into that set with some of the most legendary filmmakers, um, set designers, DOPs, was just like kind of blew my little mind. Um, and so from that moment onwards, I think is when I was really captured. What were you watching when you were younger? Like when you stepped onto the set of Hugo, had you seen all of Martin Scorsese's movies? Uh, no, uh, absolutely not. I mean, my, um, largely totally inappropriate for me. I had seen, I think the only one I'd seen uh, was The King of Comedy, um, which is one of his very few non-R rated movies. Um, and it was great and I loved it. It was, it was very funny. But I remember auditioning for that, um, and every time I t- told someone I was auditioning for it, I said, oh, yeah, it's uh, Martin Scorsese directing it. They were like, oh, my God. No, no. And as a 12-year-old at the time, I had no real scope as to what that was and, and kind of the importance of that. Because 
I liked watching kind of sci-fi action movies and the Lord of the Rings and kind of cartoons. And uh, and I'd never kind of dove into the historical and then um, and those, those films. Going back to the first gigs again, because I don't, what were you, seven when you did your first feature film or, or eight or something like that? Yeah, I was I was eight years old and then I was 10 when I had my first kind of lead role in a, a feature. I just can't really imagine having any sort of professionalism for myself when I was that age, especially in order to be able to actually complete a full feature. So I, were you just a very, you know, like focused driven kid or was that something that, you know, you kind of had to ease into the workflow a little and get used to it? Well, the top kid, you have to have certain hours of school that you would do. So I'd spend, I'd actually spend about half my time with my tutor in our trailer and I was kind of doing math or whatever it was, and kind of catching up with all my schoolwork. Um, and then when I wasn't doing that, I would go to set. And yeah, I, I mean, I can't really remember what, how, how I kind of dealt with it. But when I think about my little sister, who's 10 years old, I can't really imagine, oh, can I? I don't know. It is a weird, it is a weird thing. It is such, it is such a kind of grown up, industry um and and when i think about sex ed well, i can't imagine my little by 10 year old sister kind of merging with all of the kind of the the debauchery that, <laughs> that <laughs> happens there um so yeah i i think i was i think i just had fun with it and um and i guess i was i, I guess i must have been very professional for my age i definitely felt quite mature by the time i was a teenager i felt like i'd already kind of worked a lot and I had long conversations with adults and I felt quite like I kind of take care of myself. Um, so I think I did grow up faster than most people might. And I had to because uh, I was working. When you work with someone now, can you tell the difference between having a co-star who's been doing it at a very young age as a child actor versus someone who got into it later in life? Um, but yeah, you might have, I mean, you can tell when people have spent a lot of time on a film set, whether it's they just understand the language, and they're just a sort of, when they're kind of thinking about framing or when you see a camera, just kind of knowing where to stand so that everyone's and you're not blocking. That's just kind of comes with experience. And I can probably take that for granted now. Um, and then obviously there's not something you know and not something to get taught in drama school it's not something you can kind of learn when you're studying sort of acting techniques the only way you learn that is by being on set by actually kind of seeing it and hearing it and and, and asking people questions and, and making mistakes um so yeah and, and on a set like sex ed where there's such a broad range of people some of this their first ever job on camera for other people like jillian who've been in the industry for decades is um yeah, it's it's a real it's a real mix of people. You obviously have worked with so many incredible directors with endless resumes in iconic territory of everyone you've worked with. Is there anyone who gave you some sort of advice that will randomly pop up in your mind more often than not when you're on set? One piece of advice which is is purely kind of like and I, I and it's, and, I, and I, actually it's actually very useful when I see people not doing it. Uh, it's really small, but I think actually can make a difference. It's basically when you're on camera um, and the camera's on you and your eye line is to the person just next to the camera, you should always look in the, their eye that is closest to the lens just because that little sort of two inches or three inches, whatever it is, can make quite a lot of difference in the camera as to how much of your face you're giving. Um, and Ben and Sir Ben Kingsley told me that Hugo, and that was something that I remembered. Uh, and that's, well, that's a little one. That's an important thing there. Sticking with Hugo for a little, what was it like working with such an accomplished, like Martin Scorsese on a movie, but where he's doing something for the first time, because 3D was new to him then. So did you see kind of, I don't know, like the mixture or maybe even the clashing of new technology paired with the fact that he's done so much? Um, 
I think, I mean, I'm sure there was. Uh, I don't know how aware I was of that and of everything that's going on behind the scenes. Um, often I would, I, I sort of, we've had our rehearsal, whether it's at the start of the day or before the scene, uh, and then Marty and Bob would spend quite a long time kind of planning for shots and, and setting it up and dressing the background, getting all the sporting actors in. Um, and so by the time I got there, it's usually pretty, they'd kind of set it up. And in that time, I've probably gone back to school or something now or wherever it is. Um, so I think I got a, quite a streamlined version of what was going on on that set. Uh, but even so, it was, I wouldn't say chaotic is the word, but there was so much going on and so many people and such a huge crew that at times it was like we'd cut and we would get that, um, we'd get that and we'd change the camera angle. And then suddenly it burst into life. Like everyone would be moving. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was very cool. Um, and I think, I think for me, as I think as I said before, is one of the big, my biggest take, takeaways from that. Something I really valued that I got from Marty uh, was just an appreciation from history of film and cinema. And that's one of the core themes of the movie. Um, and so Marty would often talk to me about films that inspired him and he would give me films to watch over the weekend. We would then talk about week. Um, and it really kind of captured my imagination and, and it influenced me to kind of appreciate everything that went on in filmmaking. So that experience gave you a bigger appreciation for filmmaking, but would you say that that or maybe a different film was the one that I don't know, maybe gave you a little more clarity as far as the types of roles you want to take to amass your own filmography? I don't think there's ever a particular type of role I want to play the entire time. I feel like I've been quite lucky about being able to play quite a varied you know, filmography in terms of characters, uh, whether it's funny like in sex ed, quite humorous and, um, and relatable. And then I've played a lot more slightly more eccentric roles or much more internal roles. And um, and I enjoy just kind of, I guess, pushing myself a bit or doing at least doing something I haven't done before. Um, and I, I, I find that's what excites me when I read scripts, is finding roles and, and kind of stories that I haven't told um, or that haven't been told. Oh, Speak of the Cat is one of them. <laughs> oh, Lyra. Oh, who is this? This is Lyra. Oh. She doesn't want to say hi. Uh, that's the, yeah, that's the little girl. <laughs> they do what they want, always. Yeah. Do you ever get to bring them to set with you? Uh, no. Well, I, they're only, they turn, I only got them in September. Um, so just oh, after we finished season two. Um, it was literally, that was kind of like my, my rap present to myself. Uh, and I moved in with my brother. And we'd always wanted to get cats. Uh, and so we got them. Too. And it was perfect timing, really. So they're almost a year old. I'll be a year old next month. So they've yet to join me. I on feel like sets. that's what Otis might need in uh, sex Maybe. education. Oh, you know what? I think I should have a word with Laurie. Uh, <laughs> we need some more feline. Uh, yeah, it's, it's true. We don't, I don't think there's a single. No, that's a lie. There is a cat. There is a cat. A caravan park. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's fair. That's anyway. fair. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about working with some of your co-stars over the years. And I guess, similarly to your collaboration with directors, is there anyone growing up that you were starring opposite where, I don't know, you felt kind of what they were doing seep into you and now you find yourself doing similar things when you prep or you're on set? I think a lot of that happens quite subconsciously. Um, and it's not necessarily something you sort of see someone do something, you go like, ah. I'm going to do that because mm -hmm. everyone's, I feel like everyone's process is very personal to them. See people do things which you would never think of doing because that would totally throw you or take you out of the moment. So it's all very, um, it's all very personal and subjective. Um, I did do a film uh, about four or five years ago now called Journey's End. Um, and that was, uh, it's a British independent film about World, World War One based on a play. And I was one of five officers one of the five lead officers in this in this battalion and film largely just takes place in the dugout and as it's based on a play it's all just very sort of conversational very heavy on dialogue characters and there's very little 
action, even though it's a war film. It's it's really about these characters. And for me, that was the first time, one of the first times where I'd really felt like I was sort of an adult working amongst other adult actors and I wasn't necessarily the, the youngest one or the child actor on set. And so that was really, um, I think, really important and quite sort of guided me a bit in, in working with uh, an incredible, incredible group of, um, of the British actors who were all very inspiring to me. Um, and I think just really showed me what sort of actor I would like to be like as I as I got older and the sort of um, in the way that I hold myself and present myself and uh, in the way I work. I like that. Uh, moving on to Ender's Game here because I, I got a little bit of an attachment to that film. I love the movie. I love the book slash books. And that was hands down one of the coolest set visits I've ever been on in my <laughs> entire life. Amazing. That set was absolutely incredible. But I did want to kind so of we, get so in. Have we already, so have we already met then? Did you come to oh, set? Oh, we have. Yeah. We, we, have. we met oh, on that set. Oh, no. Oh, no. I was, yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll well, blame the, the um, eight years of, of, of time. Long uh, time ago, and it was a whole big group of people, too. Yeah, it was, that was an amazing set. And it was, in, and it was inside a NASA institute. That's yep. what was. So there were, where we were filming, and we were filming like the CGI sort of rocket scene. In the fences at the back of the set, there were real rockets real kind of space shuttles and that was yeah that was pretty cool <laughs> that, was my, that was also my first time in new orleans which was an experience it is that is an experience i've been <laughs> you must return once. there at an older age <laughs> yes yeah i need I, I need to go back uh new orleans is a lot of so I always think it is really valuable talking about bumps in the road and how you overcame them. So I am curious from your perspective, having poured so much time and energy into a movie like Ender's Game and then just not seeing it pan out as far as it being a franchise film. Because again, I do love the film and I can't account for why the masses didn't see it in order to spark the next one. But what is it like kind of sitting back and, and watching that happen upon release? I think um, I think for me, whenever you go into a part, into a, into a, a, a film or, or, or a TV show, um, obviously you hope that it hits and, 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 and people connect with it and it hits that sort of golden moment or and whatever it is in society that's going on. And you, you do get those moments where this is the show that everyone's watching because it kind of just came at the perfect time. It's what everyone needed to uplift them, whatever it is. And... There's, I feel like there's so many things that have to fall into place for that to happen. You, you can't get too caught up on it. And kind of when you do a job, in a way, you kind of have to let it go and you have to let, you let it out into the world. I've done my bit as an actor and I've, I've, I've put my sort of, I put whatever it is into that. And then that's it. And that's, and that's there. And if people love it, then fantastic. And if they don't, then you can't, can't kind of let that take the wind out of your sails um, because er, er, you're going to, everyone's going to make films that don't do well financially. It's, it's so few movies actually kind of are good. And, and it's, it's so hard to make a really sort of powerful round movie that um, you have to be able to kind of just keep moving and hope the next one kind of captures something that perhaps that one didn't. Um, and that's something you get good at as an actor. Um, especially because you audition a lot and you don't get a lot of parts. So you kind of, it's that same mindset of um, being able to kind of look, to look ahead and, uh, and stay positive. Speaking of the audition process, I did want to ask you also about Spider-Man and what happened with all of that. Because, I mean, again, I like even comparing it to Ender's Game, you seem to have handled that much more maturely than I did, where I get obsessed with the movie and I get pissed at everyone around me who doesn't love it as much. So, you know, taking that mentality to not getting a big role like that, I mean, what, what's going through your head when all that pans out? And what is the key to making sure when you come out of it, you're staying focused on the future because so, so much good can come out of not getting one thing that you might not realize at the time. It's true. Um, it's so true. And I've actually found with almost every, every, every so often you get, there's a part that you sort of really want and there's a script you love and you kind of put your heart and soul into it and you don't get it. 
and it is tough and it is shit. But I often find that something even better comes out of it at the end. Um, and so in the case of Spider-Man, uh, I did sex ed because I, I wouldn't have been able to do both of those at the same time. And I think as an actor and going up for roles, there's only so much you can do and everyone's going to have a different take on a partner and a different kind of look at a character in different ways and have a different sort of performance. And you kind of have to stick with what you think. And if that isn't necessarily in line with what the director and the producers want, then it's like there's nothing you can do about that. You might just not be the right person. And that's out of your hands. And that's something I've learned, it's something that I think is great to help me kind of just get over it. Because Tom did say amazing things with Peter, and he had an entirely different kind of portrayal of him. And I think it's worked so well in the universe and, uh, and, and in, in, in that part. And I don't think I could do it. So I think it, all things work out in the end. Yeah, for sure. As, as much as I want you to get everything that you want role-wise, I'm so happy that didn't work out because I don't know what I would, would have done without sex ed education. And I'm not just saying it because we're talking right now. Everybody at Collider knows that this has become my, it's kind of become, you know, a quarantine obsession where it's very <laughs> important to have content to consume right now, you know, you yeah. know just keep your head above water. And this is definitely yeah. something that I yeah, latched sure. onto. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity in the world at the moment. So it is, you do need, those, th those things to, to kind of shine a light and give you a bit of hope. And sex ed does that. I think it does um, very colorful and very positive and, um, Absolutely. and shines a lot of good light. And so, um, yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy. And I'm, and I'm yeah, super proud of the show. You should be. Um, is, this your, is this your first lead role in a series? In a series, yeah, it is. Uh, it is. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe when I, uh, when I first realized that, what was there any specific reason why it took you so long to commit to like a full TV series? Were you just drawn to the feature format a little more beforehand? Um, I think I was always drawn to feature films. Um, and I, when I was a kid, I didn't really watch much TV. Um, and I loved movies and um, and loved the kind of the so you got 90 minutes where you got 120 minutes where you tell the story and you've got the very you've got the beginning, middle, and end, wherever it is. Um, and there are so many different stories you can tell in that format. And while I did do a kind of a couple episodes for things here and there when I was younger, it's such a commitment joining a, a series that will go on for potentially multiple seasons. I always wanted to wait until I found whatever it was, the perfect thing. Um, and so when I read the script of Sex Ed, and it was around the time when TV and film and the kind of the lines between them were becoming a lot more blurred. You know, there were some amazing, amazing quality TV shows coming out. Game of Thrones was huge. It was like just as good, potentially, if not better, stories being told on TV. Um, and actors that traditionally might have been a film actor or a TV actor, suddenly people are doing a bit of everything. And so I thought, let's find a show um, which kind of ticks all of our boxes or try and find a show. And we were really lucky when Sex Ed because um, it, it was British and I really wanted to do something which I could do at home um, and, and was a comedy, which is something I started doing a lot more of uh, and which I love doing and love being able to kind of a bit more spontaneous and a bit more kind of uh, uh, just being able to go with it and find something quite original and potentially quite surprising um, in the humour and in, in British humour. I think that really works. And, uh, and it was youthful and it was funny and they were amazingly crafted characters that didn't kind of suffer for the laughs. They were kind of built off of each other. I think that's really hard to do. And Laurie is a phenomenal writer. And so we're reading the first episodes for Sex Ed. We're like, this could be uh, this could be really good. Um, and then I chat and then I chat to the team and met with Ben and it all kind of snowballed from there. I feel like you've probably been asked this before, but it's something that I've gotten a little obsessed with thinking about while I watch the show. But do you have any character that you identify with more so than others? I see bits of myself in in a few of the characters. I think Otis is definitely very close to me, and I think I've got a lot of myself into him. Um, and there's probably a lot of myself which I don't necessarily, which comes out in him, which doesn't necessarily come out when I'm 
at home or with my friends and a kind of <laughs> a different side to me. Um, and I think that's, yeah, I think I, I feel a lot of that. And that's, I think both of us very familiar. Um, I definitely think I'm more confident than Otis. I like to think I'm more confident than Otis <laughs> in some ways. Um, and Jackson's story too, I think his whole, his journey of being kind of this role model and being on this pedestal and have the whole school's kind of these expectations for him and, um, and him kind of feeling the weight of that pressure. I think when I was younger, I definitely would have potentially resonated with that. Um, and growing up as a, as a, as a younger actor, but like having a lot of eyes on me as a, as a sort of young person is, uh, can be quite hard. Um, and so I saw, I, I felt a connection there as well. I think, as you said, everyone can kind of see a bit of themselves in one or more of these, of these people. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that the show does so well, that people connect with it. Jackson's arc is one of the ones that I would say surprised me most. So I'm not sure how many scripts you got right out the gate, but if you, and I'm sure there's probably more than one answer to this question too, but if you had to name one member of the ensemble who took what you knew of their character at the very beginning and went above and beyond anything you ever could have imagined, who would it be and why? Oh, I can't pick one person. I actually can't. <laughs> um, everyone's so bloody good. And does so, um, even though the characters are so well written, they breathe even more life into them. Um, Emma is heartbreaking as Maeve. Um, and so like fierce and complex and wounded. Um, and, and Shuvi is like this beacon of light uh, as Eric. And I read that part and I was like, I cannot wait to meet whoever does this. And he blew my expectations out. I think he's got a very, very bright future ahead of him. Um, two of the ones that I think really surprised me were both um, Kedar and Connor, who played Jackson and Adam. Um, I think they both did an amazing job of subverting the obvious way of that their character could be played um, and really going above and beyond to make people much more kind of much much more than necessarily what everyone expects to be as a, as a, as a jock as a bully there's um, there's a lot of heart and um, a lot of conflict and a lot of internal uh, things going on for um, but yeah, that was, that, that was cool to see. I tried to write a, a written feature about the show and that's, that's what happened. Every time I highlighted a character, I had to do another one and then another one and then another one. And before I know, I knew it, the word count got out of control. Yeah. It's, um, we're lucky. We are very lucky. The writing is pretty exceptional in, uh, in that respect. Before I let you go, I don't know how much you know about season three, but I do have one season three question for you. Ooh. All right. One of my one of my favorite things as the show progresses is how certain characters that might be supporting characters wind up popping more than I thought they might have. So, of the supporting characters of the ensemble, who are you most excited to learn more about in the new season? Um, one of my favorite rela favorite relationships from season two was Jackson and Viv. Um, so I'm excited to see where that goes um, as sort of two friends from totally different worlds. And how they can kind of how that friendship blossoms or potentially conflicts, uh, I think will be quite interesting. Um, the Untouchables are always a very mysterious group, um, and I'm sure we'll see more of them in season three and their antics and what they get up to. And I'd like I'd like to see a sort of different side to them um, and see some of their. We've seen, we've seen a bit of it. We've been teased at a bit of it. But I reckon season three will get uh, hopefully a bit more in depth. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. And I'm so happy for you with everything you've accomplished. And right now in particular, sex education, because it really is something else. Thank you. That means a lot. That's kind Thank of you. you. So Thank much you for so your much, time. Yeah, was this, was, this was great. You are a very special Collider Connected because this is the first time that Dewey has sat here from start to finish. <gasps> so oh, I, wow. feel I, feel, like I feel honored. He's, he I mean, senses the cat love happening here. He, he does. I, I, just, I was trying to give it to him. I think, I think he, got, he got some purrs through the, through the sound wave. 